Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Jonah. How are you today, sir? How are you feeling this morning? What did you think about the FOMC announcement yesterday? Let's get caught up on kind of where your head's at on things. So I thought they would do 25 basis points. I thought they should do 50 basis points. So I'm very happy they did the 50. I thought they should have done 25 basis points in July. And if they wanted to go slow and steady, that would have been the right way to do it. You do 25 in July, you do 25 in September, 25 in November, 25 in December, and then we get our 100 basis points by year end. That would have been the right way to do it, in my opinion. They obviously didn't do it in July, no August meeting, no October meeting. And there was actually, there was a lot of, so the, the year over year comps for CPI were very favorable in July, August, and September meaning we had, I think it was 120 or 140 basis points rolling off from last year, being replaced by much smaller numbers this year. So we've seen CPI fall pretty hard the past couple months, now at 2.5%, probably headed to 2.2%, 2.3% in the next couple months. And then we're probably going to stay there for a while, because as we get into the end of this year and early next year, the comps are not as easy. We don't have those big numbers rolling off anymore. So we'll probably stay around 2.3%, you know, give or take for the next four or six months. But it was still the right decision to cut rates by 50 basis points. There's a little bit of economic weakness. I mean, you can find it if you look for it. Some of these bank CEOs are talking about higher defaults or higher delinquencies. Nothing major, nothing too alarming, but it's there uh, labor market certainly showing some weakness. Uh, the BLS just removed eighteen or uh, eight hundred and eighteen thousand jobs uh, from the last twelve months. That needs to be taken into consideration. So, fifty bips was the right way to go. Yesterday's sell-off was a little bit concerning, but nice to see the futures backing uh, bouncing back today. So, it looks like it's going to be a be, be a really good day for the markets. The question is whether or not we can hold these gains into the close. Do we see some fading or do we see money coming out, of, you know, coming off the sidelines and accelerating these gains throughout the day? So I have some hedges on in my investment portfolio. I'm not ready to take them off yet. But if we see uh, if we see some significant buying after the open, I'll have to get out of my hedges, take the uh, take the loss on those and then let my longs rip higher. So, I mean, I'm having a very, very good year. So I was a little overly cautious uh going into the close yesterday i just i wasn't sure what day you know what we'd what we'd look like today um there was a, a you know a chance that the markets would overreact in a negative way to the 50 basis points cut thinking that the fomc sees something around the corner that the rest of us don't see uh i don't think that's true i think we're all looking at the same data so yeah overall i'm pretty happy or what's your expectation into the end of the year so, I mean, I think it could be a good Q4. We're going to get, obviously, two more rate cuts in November and December. The big bogey we have to worry about is the election. I mean, this is so, so September is seasonally a weak month. The last two weeks of September are even weaker. I think they're actually the two worst weeks of the entire year. Yep. So we're in that right now. But I think the rate cut we got yesterday sort of, you know, overshadows the seasonal weakness. But we still have an election in less than seven weeks. And, you know, we're going to see uh, Trump and Harris taking all sorts of shots at each other over the next seven weeks and making all kinds of promises regarding taxes and tariffs. So um, I, I think but with that said, I think we can rally into year end, assuming we don't get any big macro surprises, wars. You know, there's still some some pretty shady geopolitical stuff going on out there. So, I mean, my net exposure, my investment portfolio is only 50%. Uh, I'm up 250% year to date in that portfolio. So, you know, I've already made my money. I'm not looking to put it at risk. If we rip higher, I'll certainly try to grab some of those gains. But, you know, for the most part, I'm just trying to hold on to what I have. But with that said, I, I don't think valuations look very compelling right here. I was adding to my longs very aggressively back in early August on that pullback. Remember that massacre Monday? That was ugly. Markets got hammered. I was in there buying aggressively. I've actually been trimming my positions pretty aggressively the past week. So I've trimmed about 30% of my portfolio, 30% of my longs. 
Um, so I just, I don't think value, you know, a lot of stocks are trading at some pretty nosebleed valuations. I mean, I have some shorts on right now. I'm shorting Palantir. I know there's oh. a lot of people out there that love Palantir. I'm yeah. sorry. The stock is not worth 90 times earnings. Um, I mean, if you look at the estimates going forward, analysts are looking for like 25% EPS growth over the next four or five years. I think Palantir would have to do at least double that in order to justify the current valuation, which I just think is very unlikely. So I don't know how long I'm going to, I'm going to stay in that Palantir short. It's pretty new. I put it on last week. Um, and if the markets rip higher and Palantir goes higher, my longs are all going higher too. So it's not like I'm really, it's only 1% short. So it's not like it's going to, it's not like it's going to be too painful. My other yeah. shorts are Kava, another favorite of FinTwit. Stock's done very well this year. That's a new short. That stock's trading at like $47 million per location, which is ridiculous. There's probably like 20 restaurants in the whole country that are worth $47 million each, but somehow every Kava location is worth $47 million. Makes no sense. Another short is Wingstop, which is actually even more expensive than Kava. Uh, and then other two shorts are Costco, which is trading at 50 times next 12 month earnings. Once again, they're growing earnings at like 15%. The stock's probably overvalued by 2X. I mean, I don't expect it to drop 50%, but I don't think there's much more multiple expansion in stocks like Costco and Intuitive Surgical. Great company. I love the company. It's not worth 70 times earnings. So like that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to keep most of my longs and then just adding some shorts in stocks that I think are really, really expensive. Got it. So we know what you don't like now. Let's talk about what you like. What, you know, I know that I ran through all your scans this morning. There's some pretty good looking things out there. You're saying yep. that you you had quite a few setups that you were keeping an eye on too. Love to kind of see where your head's at with those scans and what they're finding. Yeah. So I mean, I'm like I said, I'm I'm fully invested in my in my investment portfolio. So as of this morning or coming into today, I had about 140% longs and about 98% hedges and shorts. Actually, it's probably closer to 100% when you include the uh, the five single shorts that I have. So net exposure is pretty low, but my longs have done very, very well this year. My biggest positions, App Lovin, Transmedics, On Running, Aspen. So those are all big positions for me. And if you look at them on the charts, they all look phenomenal. So Aspen, you know, if you're looking to get into a stock like Aspen, um, I was buying this last summer in the sixes and sevens. It's had this little recent pullback, but as it starts to push through this VWAP here, I think you can put on a trade with a stop loss below that VWAP if it doesn't hold. Transmedics is in a similar position. I look at VWAPs that, that have provided multiple days of resistance. So if you look at uh, Transmedics, this VWAP going back to this high, which was the Q2 earnings gap up. So there is some relevance to it. Two of the last three days. So yesterday it finally broke through, but so yesterday was so Monday and Tuesday, that VWAP provided resistance both days. So yesterday's push through, I think was meaningful. So if you're not in Transmedics, I think you can get into Transmedics now above this VWAP with a stop loss below it. So I would not chase app at this point. I was buying app very aggressively back at the August lows. The stock is now up 110% over the past five and a half weeks since those August 5th lows. If you look at app loving on a weekly chart, so we just pushed through the all-time high this week and it just didn't stop. So, I mean, this stock has been an absolute beast the past five or six weeks. I would not chase it here. I would wait for a pullback. No, I have no idea when a pullback happens. I was loading up on app loving down here. The stock was trading at like eight times or nine times next 12 month EBITDA. Now that it's up 110% since then, you know, that that multiple is essentially doubled, although the estimates have actually gone higher as well. So let's say what was nine times next 12, 12 month EBITDA is now 18 times, which is still very reasonable for a company that's growing EBITDA right now at like 45, 50% and should continue to grow it at probably 25 or 30% for the next few years. So it's definitely not expensive. It's just not as cheap as it was a month ago, but I don't know if I would chase it. I think there's other stocks that we're gonna look at that are setting up better, just starting to break out. They've been consolidating. 
recent pullbacks, pushing through 200-day moving averages, that sort of thing. So I still love the company, but wouldn't chase it here. A couple stocks that I think you can chase, they've had big runs the past few weeks, but these are more of your interest rate sensitive names that should do well, should see some multiple expansion as uh, as the Fed continues to cut rates. A firm is one of them. I have a swing trade on a firm. That looks great. I don't know if I would chase it this morning, up 5.5% pre-market. Maybe if you get any sort of a pullback towards 45. Another stock that I'm in right now that looks great is Zillow. So all of the real estate stocks look pretty good right now. All of the lending mortgage names look pretty good right now. I think Zillow is like, I don't know, I call it like the safest way to play the real estate space. I mean, other names would include Redfin, which I just think is a lot more speculative, but it's also performed much better in the past few weeks. So if you're looking for real estate, you're looking for high beta, probably go Redfin. If you're looking for something a little bit more conservative, higher quality, better balance sheet, better management, well, I should say better management, but uh, higher quality, I would go Zillow. Redfin, I think, is more of a trade or it would be a trade for me. Zillow, I think, is a name that I could hold for the next couple of years. Because I think if we are in a this rate cutting or rate easing cycle, mortgage rates, we all know they were under 3% a couple of years ago. They ripped all the way up to 75 or 8%. Now they should be back down under 6% in the next week or two. That is going to help accelerate or spark real estate activity, bring some some new uh, inventory into the market. So I think Zillow is a name that could certainly rally in Q4. So other stocks that I like right now, AMD, I think you can use the 200-day as your stop loss. So some of the names that I've been adding the past couple of weeks that I think could rally into Q4 based on next year's estimates that I believe are too low. Zillow, I think, is one. AMD is another one. Reddit is another stock that I was adding at, adding to somewhat aggressively the past few weeks. I think Reddit's a name that could do very, very well. I think it's kind of like this sneaky social media slash AI stock. I mean, they don't have AI, but they have the data that AI companies want. And I think they had one of the best Q2 reports that nobody's really paying attention to. Stocks that I've been trimming, just because I think valuations are getting a little bit rich on running. So anyone that's been following me on Twitter or paid subscribers knows that I've been a big fan of on running for the past 12, 18 months. My closet with all my sneakers, I think I'm up to 22 or 23 pairs of on running sneakers. But when I was buying the stock back at those August lows, I think it was trading at 24 times, maybe 20 times next 12 month EBITDA. Stock's up 50% in the past five and a half weeks. So now 20 times EBITDA is now 30 times EBITDA. EBITDA is probably only going to grow at 30% for the next few years. So I just, if you're trying to trade it, it still looks pretty good. I mean, nice uptrend. If you're trying to own it, I just think there's better names out there at this price. I know I'm like, I'm going back and forth between stocks that I own and stocks that I'm trading. I don't know how much, like how deep to go on. Because I mean, all of my paid subscribers know exactly what I own. So they, they can see my spreadsheet. They know what my core holdings are. They know what my swing trades are. The problem is there's a lot of probably free subscribers on here too that have no idea what I own or what I call a core holding versus a swing trade. For me, core holdings in my investment portfolio, which is still the, ma the majority of my assets, activity, et cetera. So, I mean, that is really where I'm focused. And then I do swing trades to sort of complement my core holdings. But core holdings are stocks with phenomenal fundamentals, very compelling valuations that I plan to hold for two or three years. So Celsius was a core holding for four years. And then I finally sold it back in March because the valuation just got way too expensive for me. And I saw revenues decelerating, you know, growth slowing down. And I knew that multiple would get cut. I didn't think Celsius would drop 70%. It did. I'm glad that I got out when I did. I mean, it was basically uh, almost a 30 bagger for me over four years. So I did pretty well with Celsius. I tried getting, if you go back to the weekly chart, I got into Celsius back in April or May. I think it was May of 2020. So down here around $2 a share split adjusted and got out at an average price of 86 or $87. So I started selling my position when we got this big rip in February and then finally got out on the way back down. I think I started trimming here, added again on this pullback, and then finally got, got out at 86 or 87 on the way out here. So either way, 
turned out to be a very good long-term hold for me. Uh, now that it's pulled back 70%, I did try to get back in a few weeks ago. I was looking at support, go back to 2021. I guess maybe it was that, I guess it was that support there. Yeah, around 3620. I was looking at that support holding up also the 200, the 200 week moving average. So when we got that bounce off the 200 week, I started a position in Celsius after this big pullback, but then I ended up selling it a couple of weeks later at $35 when the company announced that Pepsi still has way too much inventory and it could be another $100 million of offloading that they have to do with that inventory you know, over the next three to six months. So I, I think Celsius is dead money right now until Pepsi clears out their inventory, until the company gives a little bit more clarity on what's going on with international. I just think the energy drink market has taken a big blow the past six months or so. There's been some viral videos that have gone out about some of the health concerns around some of the ingredients, some of which are not true, but it doesn't matter. I think people have been kind of scared out of energy drinks in general. So uh, I just, I think energy drinks, I mean, Red Bull's not not publicly traded, but I, I think Monster and Celsius are, are probably dead money for a little while. So, I mean, you could probably trade it here. Maybe if it pushes through back through those November 2021 highs or if it pushes through the the 20 day moving average here, but I'm, I'm not planning to get back into Celsius anytime soon. I just know a lot of people are probably asking about the stock because I used to follow it pretty closely. But back to my core holdings, I mean, this is what I try to do, try to find stocks that I can own for two or three years as fundamentals are strong and improving, possibly accelerating multiple catalysts on the horizon that are not being priced in by the markets or the analysts, where if those catalysts play out as I expect, you would see a big increase in estimates, big multiple expansion. And that's how I've done very, very well over the past few years with Celsius, SMCI. So I was a big SMCI guy coming into this year. I had a 13 or 14% position coming into January. That stock rallied 300 or 400% early in the year, sold off 95% of my shares. I still have a 3% position in SMCI. But I mean, once again, if you look at this stock, I mean, it basically round did a full round trip. For anyone that wrote it up and wrote it all the way down, I, I feel bad. But I mean, this is why active management is so important. This is why risk management is so important. This is why you have to understand the fundamentals, the valuations. I loved SMCI in the 200s and 300s, but as that stock got into the 800s, 900s, and up to 1200, I just could not justify holding my position. I mean, that stock basically, I think I had a thousand dollar two year or three year price target when the stock was trading in the, the, the mid 200s. It got to my price target three months later. It would have been stupid not to sell off my shares. So, I mean, I, I just think that's... That's where some retail investors fall short. Even if they're able to identify some of these stocks early on, they don't know when to get out. They don't know when to trim. They don't want to pay taxes. So they don't take profits. And then they end up with a stock like this that does a full round trip on them. Or God forbid, they chased it at the highs and rode it all the way down thinking, you know, because they didn't want to take a loss along the way. So a lot of people on here are more traders than investors. If you're a trader, I mean, hopefully you did not hold it all the way down. You would have broken pretty much every rule as a trader if you had done that. So anyone that wrote it down is probably in that investor camp. But I mean, just because you're an investor, a long-term investor, doesn't mean you you know shouldn't have any discipline. And then if you look at like other stocks that I've done very well with Transmedics, I mean, this is almost a 10-bagger, probably an eight-bagger for me over the last three years. The company continues to put up amazing fundamentals, continues to beat and raise. And then like another stock that some of you know, I'm a big fan of Aspen. I talked about this earlier. This is one of those stocks that does have those those significant catalysts on the horizon that I don't think are being fully priced into the stock right now. So they should get approved for a DOE loan, Department of Energy, to build a new facility to increase their capacity. And that should really help the stock move higher. And then they're also, they've also talked about another big OEM. They said it's going to be a German company. Most likely it would be Mercedes or BMW. So either way, it should be a huge win for the company company. I don't think that's being priced into the stock right now. Uh, the company's also said that a, a big chunk of their sales come from GM EV sales. GM is estimating 200 to 250,000 of sales this year for EVs. Uh, Aspen's only using 180,000 for their projection. So if GM does at least 200 or closer to 250, there's a lot of upside in Aspen's 
uh, full year guidance. So, I mean, once again, like I just think if you're going to be a really, really good investor or really good swing trader, you need to have a grasp on the fundamentals, the stories, the valuations. Now, it can get you in trouble sometimes, or at least it will keep you out of some of the biggest winners. For instance, Palantir has been a huge winner recently. I already said that I uh, I got into a short last week. I'm a little bit underwater on that short. I'm not too worried about it right now. But I mean, I thought this stock was overvalued all year long. I did trade it a little bit, made some money on it. But I mean, if you sometimes if you focus too much on the valuation, you won't trade the stocks that turn out to be the biggest winners. So I mean, it, I guess that cuts both ways. So, you know, we've talked through big winners. We've talked through kind of names that you're focused on. Let's talk through how you're finding them. Yep. You know, that's kind of the big piece here. There's a bunch of people here who have probably seen this already. But like you said, there's a bunch of free subscribers who maybe aren't super familiar. So let's talk through these scans. Yeah. So this, so the custom scanners that I have with TrendSpider. So there's the 52 week highs or there's, there's the breakouts. There's the retests. There's the consolidations. There's the VWAP breakthroughs or reclaims. So then there's the 200-day reclaim and the 50-day reclaim. I don't like trading stocks when they're bouncing or you're hoping they're going to bounce off something because if it's if you're hoping it's going to bounce, it's on the way down. That means there's still more sellers than buyers. And to hope that that flips from more buyers to sellers at a specific point, I just don't, I don't like the risk reward of that. So I prefer to buy stocks on the way up as they reclaim the 200, as they reclaim the 50, because that does show there's more buyers than sellers at that point. So now, I mean, that doesn't mean like, for instance, here, Palantir pretty much bounced off the 200 day. It doesn't mean that it can't bounce. It just, I don't don't like to I don't like the risk reward of those trades hoping that it bounces and a lot of times if you had I mean there was probably a good chance that if you were buying Palantir you know trying to trade it here hoping that it bounced you probably would have had your stop somewhere around there so you probably would have gotten stopped out anyways and I mean the algorithms the algos and the high frequency high frequency traders know that they're typically going to you know they're going to try to blow as many people out of their position and hit as many stops as they can on the way down so once again I just I don't like that strategy. So, so most of the custom scanners have to do with reclaiming a specific level. So if you look at the anchored VWAP, DraftKings is a perfect example. So, so with pre-market, we are pushing through now. So let me look at look at pre-market. So perfect example. So the 200-day moving average, the VWAP from the March high resistance, the last, well, three out of the last four days. So if you can push through that 200-day and the VWAP, I believe that's meaningful. So if I didn't have a position in DraftKings and I do, I'd be looking to start a position above the 200-day after the open today. So that's, that's the sort of aim that I'm looking for right now. Recent pullback, coming off the lows, and now showing some strength with with more buyers than sellers. I mean, we can look at volume too. Yeah, the gambling stocks have been looking pretty good. Penn came up in the gapper scan too. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, we're into the NFL season, big for these companies. DraftKings is still the leader in NFL betting. Apparently week one was bad for the books. Week two was good for the books, you know, based on how many upsets and underdogs are winning, that sort of thing. But I mean, overall, I think it should be a, a pretty strong season for, for the online sports books like DraftKings. The three are going to be DraftKings, Flutter, which looks really good on the charts right now, and Penn. So Penn is partnered up with ESPN. So they're they're powering ESPN Bet. But ESPN Bet is still like a distant third behind Flutter, which owns FanDuel and then DraftKings. So if I was going to play it, I would, I mean, I think all three charts look pretty good right now. Penn right here. So I would say if Penn pushes through 2035, I'm definitely interested, but I still think DraftKings is the one that I would probably go with right now. FTV. So here's another one. So you do have these VWAPs from the highs earlier this year, but I would look to start a position on the push through the 200 day. Look at the Russell 2000. Now I'm fully in invested in my trading portfolio as well. So I'm not looking to do too much today, especially because a lot of these stocks are going to gap up. I don't love chasing gap ups, but in my trading portfolio, just to kind of give you a, a rough idea of what I own. So this is my current 
trading portfolio right now. So as you can see, so AZEK is a building supply company, building product supply company. I bought it a couple of days ago on this push through the VWAP, which obviously I found using the same VWAP scam we're looking at right now. And that's obviously a name that I think can do pretty well uh, with the interest rate cuts yesterday. BLDR, same thing. Got into this stock a few days ago. Actually got into this stock about a week ago. When we pushed through the 200 day. That stock looks really good right now. Obviously helped by the interest rate cuts yesterday. CLBT bought this stock, I believe on this push through the VWAP. That looks good. DraftKings I own. So I got into DraftKings a couple of weeks ago on the push through the 200 day moving, uh, the 200 day EMA. And then now we're running into the 200 SMA. Exact Sciences I've owned since we pushed through this VWAP a couple of weeks ago. Hood. I mean, so as you like most of these, a lot of these stocks are ones that corrected and now they're showing strength and pushing through these VWAP. So once again, uh, Hood got that uh, on the push through this VWAP. So the 50 day and the VWAP. Keysight, same thing, pushed through the 200 day a few days ago. So MongoDB, uh, this was a big gap up on earnings. So I bought this one on the pullback into the five, six, seven, eight day moving average. I did have to lower my stop loss a couple of times. Right now it's under the the 20 day Oscar. I got into this one on, yeah, so it pushed through the VWAP, but I didn't get into that one until we pushed through these highs here. So I got into Oscar at 18, yeah, 1860. Yep. So I got into Oscar on 911. Yep. So 911. So got in 1860. As soon as you push through those highs there, that's obviously worked out really well. Now I would put it into like, now it's probably going to show up on the breakout screener, you know, breakout through these 52 week highs. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't buy it here, but I would buy it if it did clear, call it 2331. Payoneer, so got into this one once again on that push through the VWAP. Looks pretty good. Right now, looks like it wants to break out through the 52-week high. I think you can buy it above 757 you know, with a stop loss probably just below that. So if it can't hold 757, get out with a small loss. PRCT, bought this one on 99. So I I think I kind of broke my rule. I bought this one on the push through the VWAP and then lowered my stop loss. So I didn't, I probably should have gotten stopped out to be honest. I didn't because I really liked the name and I believe I ended up kind of looking at that uh, 74.92 level. So as long as we held that, which we did, I was going to stay in the name and then that worked out pretty well. Reddit, so Reddit's a big position or a a position in both of my portfolios. I bought this one 912 at 6140. Yeah. So once again, kind of broke my rule here, bought it on the push through the VWAP, didn't get out here like I probably should have because I was looking at this VWAP here. So these VWAPs from the August 7th lows held up multiple times. So I figured as long as we stayed above those VWAPs, I would stay in the name. And that obviously worked out well. Roku got in on this 912, 7250 five, seven. Yeah. So, so I, so I got in on the push to that VWAP. So that's the VWAP going back to the November 23 highs. Sentinel one got in 917. Yeah. Got in on the push through the 200 day just a couple days ago. SE got in on that push through the VWAP. Shark Ninja I've been in for yeah, almost a, uh, about three or four weeks now. Got in on 829. So 29. So, okay. So I have that big move on the 28th. I don't know what that was from. And then once it pushed back through the five six EMA. I jumped in with position and then I've written that up. Uber got in on the push through the VWAPs from the highs earlier this year. And then Zillow Group got in 916 at 59.45. Okay, so I right, so I've owned Zillow for I don't know a month or so in my investment portfolio. I just got in a few days ago on my trading portfolio when we pushed through the highs from uh February. So so that's my trading portfolio. And as you can tell, I mean, a lot of these stocks I found through these, through the VWAP scanner. So I really like buying the stocks as they push through the VWAP from the 52 week high, because I can use that, you know, for my risk management. Are there any names that are setting up right now that you've got a close eye on that you haven't gotten into yet, but you're watching them? So Coors, C-O-R-Z was one pushing through these highs from July. I'd love to get a retest a little bit of a, maybe a bounce off 1237 or 1224. And then I would start a position probably with a stop loss somewhere down there. So that's one. Hims, which I do have a position in my investment portfolio. But now that we've cleared the 50 day and we're starting to push through these highs from March, I like Hims above 1718. On the gap up scan, I know people have been talking quite a bit about solar names, EMPH. Yeah. So solar. So I mean, there's two things that's, that could help solar. One, 
lower rates because a lot of, you know, especially residential, because a lot of solar customers are financing their their purchase, their panels. So lower financing rates will definitely help the industry. And then two is if Harris wins. So mm. you know, the thought is that a Trump win would be bad for solar and a Harris win would be good for solar. But, you know, who knows? I mean, um, that's just, I think that's what the market believes. I'm not, you know, I'm going to keep my opinion out of it, but ESRT. So this is one. So if we can get through 1115, I'm definitely interested in that one. I mean, in general, like a lot of the REIT names should look pretty good today. So this is, so sometimes instead of trading any individual REITs, I'll just trade DRN, which is the leveraged REIT. REIT ETF. And as you can tell, I mean, this this one looks pretty good. I would expect it to continue to look good if the Fed continues to cut rates. So, I mean, as you go scanners, like a lot of the a lot of the uh, regional bank stocks look pretty good. A lot of the REITs look pretty good, but I would prefer to trade DRN and FAS. So FAS, yeah, I mean, something like that. If it can push through 134.19, I'm probably interested. I mean, others, so Rocket Mortgage, I'm definitely interested. I don't know exactly where I would get in definitely, I would say definitely above 2130, maybe even so it's up three and a half this morning. I mean, this is this is one that I would probably consider chasing after the open, just because I think there's a lot more juice left in it. I mean, Redfin's another one. I already have Zillow, but I mean, this chart looks pretty compelling as well. I'm just waiting to see what these stocks look like after the open. You know, are they going to accelerate to the upside or are we going to see see some pullbacks? On the anchored VWAP scan, there were a handful of good looks. Tap, Coors was one. Tap and Target was another. I've tried trading Target. I'm just not in it right now. So Target had a big gap up. You can't see it here. So big gap up on earnings. And then it really gave back. I mean, pretty much gave back all, all of, it. of it, actually. Now that it's back above the 200-day, I think it looks pretty interesting. TJX was another one that gapped up on earnings. I mean, that looks somewhat interesting here if it could hold the 20-day. So I would, I would consider a position there. Although I would probably, so rather than buy it showing weakness, I would rather, I'd rather buy it above the VWAP. So if TJX, TJX can push through this VWAP. That's where I'd probably be interested. See target. Yeah, there you go. I mean, I mean, perfect rejection yesterday at the VWAP from the gap up candle. I probably wouldn't. I guess you could buy it here. You could buy it here with a stop loss, maybe 149.86. I'd probably rather buy it above that VWAP. The VWAP that it's gaining right now is the March high. Yeah. So, I mean, so sometimes, I mean, these charts can look a little bit different whether or not you're looking at, you know, extended hours or not. So, I mean, taking off extended hours I mean, that's a pretty clean rejection yesterday at that VWAP. So For sure. TAP was another. Yeah, so it's just above that. I don't think this one would interest me only because you still have the 200 EMA here, 200 SMA here. I just think that's that's too much resistance. So I would rather trade this one above that VWAP rather than down here. ASO looks different, although I think, I think you missed this one. So that would have been a nice name to buy on that push through the 200. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't buy that now. OI I've been watching, but that's sort of the same, same story is tap trying to push through this VWAP here, but then you still have the 200 day moving averages to deal with just above. So I'd rather wait until we cleared those pre breakout. Ulta so, was another. Yeah. So that gapped up on the Berkshire Hathaway purchase. I don't think it did much since. CNO, I mean, I think this is, yeah, this is a bank, I believe. So, I mean, another, a lot of these banks look like this. They peaked earlier in the summer, had this pullback, rallied another pullback. And then a lot of the real estate names. So Cushman Wakefield is a big uh, commercial real estate company that looks pretty good potential breakout there home builder kbh yeah, and the whole idea of this scan in particular you're looking for price just below a really important high yep. right that's the whole thing on this one so it's not you're not buying the names you're putting these names on watch and looking for the breakout because this is this is where right I'm not I'm not buying them unless they break out. So in this case, probably potentially be a buyer of E above seventy five ninety three. Potentially a buyer of ESRT above eleven fifteen. I don't know how other people do this. I mean, sometimes it's hard to know like what's the breakout level. Is it the absolute high that day? Is it the close that day? Is it the the open on the red candle? So I I don't know. I go back and forth on this. Typically, I'm not looking at the I'm not looking at the wicks as much as as the the close on green days and then the open on red days so in this case like 11 you know called 11 13 I actually don't buy breakouts 
<laughs> oh, you don't? Okay. No, no, that's not really my style. I always look for pullbacks. I'm I'm a price action guy, so I'm kind of looking for like on this particular chart on E, I'd be looking at like 61, kind of where there's kind of like an inverted head and shoulders kind of thing. The July, like July 23rd. 3rd, July 24th low takes you down to the actual, the, the August low, and then you gain from there. So I'd be looking at that July 23rd low. You, there's kind of a gap, uh, like August 11th. See that big, like that big, they gap down and then they gap up kind of around August 11th, August 12th, somewhere in there. What about like, so something like C C O R Z. So you wouldn't buy this breakout. You'd rather buy the next pullback. Yep, I'd rather buy it at like ten seventy with a stop below nine or something like that. Is kind of how I would do it. So you so you like buying? I mean, do you like buying pullbacks to the the fifty or the hundred or the two hundred or? Depending? I personally, I personally don't use moving averages too much. Okay. I'll you I just use sheer price action levels stuff okay. that should have where they should have rejected but they didn't. If they just gain right through a level then I'm always looking for that level to come back in and act as support at some point. I really want to see like powerful moves through levels and then taking the trade when price comes back to that spot. Any level that that should have acted as support or resistance, any powerful move through that, I'm always trying to buy the retest either either it's if like, it's either if it's uh higher or lower. So like my investment portfolio, my core holdings, I mean I I only add on pullbacks. Like I don't ever add to positions, you know, near 52 week highs or breaking out. Like that's, that's what I'm trimming the positions. I, you know, I've already, I've already done the adding on the pullback and now I'm trimming on the rallies. I mean, not right. always that blunt, but, and then in my trading portfolio, which is, you know, more pure swing trading, it's like the opposite. You know, I'm, I'm typically getting stopped out on the pullbacks and then I'm, you know, I'm buying or starting positions on the strength, on the breakouts. And then the swing trades in my investment portfolio are like something in the middle where like a stock is pulling back to the 20 day or the 50 day. And that's when the valuation starts to make a little bit more sense to me. So that's where I start a swing trade in my investment portfolio, knowing that I might hold it a little bit longer than a swing trade in my trading portfolio, which is really just based on technicals. If you're entering into a trade in your trading portfolio, how do you make the determination that that trade should become a swing trade or vice versa? So in my trading portfolio, everything's a swing trade, like based purely on technical. Okay, got it. I guess maybe the question is then, how do you go from what is meant to be just like a shorter term trade into something that becomes an investment. Do you do you ever have that happen where you get into something thinking, oh, I'm going to be in this for a couple of days or whatever, and then you realize after those couple of days that you need to stay in it quite a bit longer? And how do you do how do you make that determination? So in my investment portfolio, like <laughs> I've been, I mean, I've kind of been dissecting it this year and like breaking it down into groups. You know, core holdings are my highest conviction names, the ones I'll probably hold the longest, the best fundamentals, the most upside, right? That's Transmedics, that's App Lovin', that's On Running. And then even in my swing trades, I sort of have it broken down in my head uh, between non core, non core holdings. And then swing trades. So, so for instance, like AMD is technically a swing trade for me in my investment portfolio, but it's a stock that I plan on holding longer because I think that, like, I think it's setting up for a really, really strong 2025 as they launch their AI chips. If you look at the estimates for next year, I think they're too low, but I also think the stock looks pretty compelling on a valuation basis. So even though this is a swing trade for me, it's probably a stock that I'm going to hold longer so I'm thinking it more like an investment. So like I kind of have an investment thesis for it. Robinhood is the same way. Technically a swing trade for me, but I'm probably going to own this stock for longer. I like the fundamentals. I like the story. 24 million funded accounts. Average account size, only 5,000. I think that average account size increases dramatically over the next three, four, or five years. Robinhood's adding new products, credit cards, all sorts of stuff. So I, I like the story versus a name like, I'll say shop. So I have a swing trade in shop that I started. I think I started on this push through the 200 day. I let it come back here. I had my stop below the 200 EMA. It bounced there, so I stayed in it. This is a name that if it can't hold the 200 
EMA, I'm definitely out because I just don't think the the, the fundamentals are that. Fundamentals are fine, but for a stock that's trading at like 100 times earnings, the fundamentals are not as good as they should be. So like the fundamentals are decent. The valuation is not compelling. So this is not a stock that I would make into an investment. It's just purely a swing trade. Another one is, I guess, Elf. So, well, I don't know. So I owned Elf for about 18 months, wrote it up from maybe... 80 or 90. I don't know. I'm not really sure. I actually, I was probably in it longer than that. Maybe in here. So somewhere probably in the 70s is probably when I got into Elf, wrote it up. I think I sold my position somewhere around 200, rallied up to 221, and then pulled back like 50%. So I actually got back into Elf last week because I saw, so if you look at the weekly chart, so when it bounced off the 150 week moving average, I started a position there. And I wasn't sure yet if I was going to keep my stop loss below the 150 or because the stock had already pulled back 50%, valuation was starting to make a lot more sense. Management gave their guidance for fiscal 25. And then they said it was very conservative guidance. So I think the estimates are probably too low for this year or next year. So I felt like valuation finally made sense. So I was kind of undecided if this was going to be a swing trade or a non-core holding, meaning non-core holdings. Like I don't have high conviction, but I think the valuation is compelling enough where I'm willing to add on pullbacks. And with Elf, I thought maybe, you know, worst case, the stock goes down to 90. So do I want to average down to 90? You know, like I hadn't really made that decision yet. So far, I haven't had to because it's it's held at 150. So right. there's stocks like that in my portfolio where, you know, big pullback, valuation start to make sense. Okay, it's bouncing off of support. Let's start a position and see how it goes. And, you know, just kind of play it day by day. Where like I don't I don't really have a plan yet with Elf. You know, if, if the markets were tanking today and, and Elf took out 106, then I would or yeah, took out 106.24, I'd probably get out of my position and look for a better, a better entry down the road. Yeah. Cool, man. This has uh, been very informative. I wanted to address a couple of there were a couple of folks who were asking about a couple of different charts. Wanted you to look at Sound S O U N and Four F O U R. Four Four looks much better. Um, I haven't looked in Sound. So some other, I mean, just quickly, some other names that are on my radar today. So C T V A is one. It looks like you know it might be a breakout in the next few days. So yeah, there's definitely. I mean, going through these scanners this morning, there's definitely 15 or 20 names that are on my radar. But like I said, I'm fully invested. My long exposure is 100 percent in my trading portfolio. So I'm not looking to do too much today, especially on these gap ups. Um, Okay, S O U N. So, I mean, pretty clear to me. I wouldn't touch this one unless it's unless it clears these V WAPs. So, two big rejections at those V WAPs from the March highs. So, no reason to own it until you clear those. I mean, maybe you can trade it from here to the V WAP, but for me personally, that's not really my style. I'd rather just wait to clear the V WAPs. And if you clear the V WAPs, you know, maybe maybe that's when you move. It's not a name I follow. So like, I have no idea what the fundamentals look like. No idea what the valuation looks like. I just, I know it's a pretty speculative name. And then the other one was four. Yeah. So four looks pretty good. Uh, Jared Isaacman, the CEO is back from space. So him and his crew, the Polaris mission with SpaceX just did the first commercial commercial air, air walk, spacewalk, probably spacewalk ever. So that was pretty cool. So four is my fourth largest position in my investment portfolio. I actually bought some puts the week before Jared went into space because- there was Just a, in case. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like it's a freaking risky ass mission yeah. for the CEO of a publicly traded company to be going into outer space. Like, <laughs> damn it, dude. I mean, my fourth biggest position, like, God forbid, I mean, I can say it now because obviously they're back on earth safely. So, you know, now we can say the bad stuff, but like, <laughs> God forbid, you know, that freaking capsule blows up. I mean, what does the stock do? Tank 20% the next day? Right. So, like I needed to protect my position. So I was like one third hedged with some puts and now the stock has ripped the past couple of weeks. So those puts have gone to complete shit. So, you know, I lost I don't know, half a percent on them, you know, overall half a percent of my portfolio. So not, not that big of a deal, like meaning yeah. like half of 1% of my, of performance. So 
I'm up 250% year to date. You know, now you can trim off half a percent for the, the four puts, not that big of a deal. But in terms of the chart, so I mean, looks good here. At this point, I'm not sure I would start a position until we cleared either 8701 or 8812. So those are like the two levels that I would look for to like call this a breakout. So, I mean, if you own it now, I think you definitely hold it. If you're looking to start a new position, I'd probably wait until it cleared 8812 to do so. Just just my just my opinion. Right on. You want to take a few more? Yeah. Next one's TEM. T E M. So I think that's a recent IPO. Yeah, it is. Mm. So I don't know anything about the company. Yeah, not much on it. Obviously, you can see AI in the name. Yep. I feel so, like there's gonna be a lot of those here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think S O N is supposed to be an AI name as well. So mm -hmm. I mean, for this one, I just think it's pretty clear, like no reason to own it below these VWAPs. So I would say once you clear 5867, somewhere in there, then I think it's, uh, then, then I think I would probably get in it myself, you know, because recent, recent IPOs, you know, you're typically dealing with a smaller float. So these names can, can rip pretty hard. You just have to know when the IPO lockup is. So looks like the IPO was on June 14th. So six months from June. So there's probably, yeah, so probably IPO lockup at the end of this year. So you probably have another two or three months for this name to to move around without concerns of the IPO lockup. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I am I would be interested above, yeah, 5838, somewhere in there. Uh, ERJ. Yeah, so I've traded this one a few times. Aerospace name, the chart looks pretty good. I'm obviously not in it right now. It hasn't really popped up on my screens recently. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, there's a lot of stocks like this that are in this clear uptrend. They occasionally pull back to the 10 day, the 15 day, the 20 day, and then they bounce. Like, that's kind of how I play these names instead. Like, there really hasn't been a meaningful pullback, and then you're reclaiming the 200 or VWAP or, you know, an extended consolidation before a breakout. So I wouldn't personally get into ERJ here. I would either wait for that pullback to the 15 or 20 day, or I would wait for a, um, you know, an extended consolidation here and then get in on the breakout. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. For sure. So these are, I mean, this is kind of like, like Zeta sort of did this. Like you didn't get, I mean, it's been just this clear uptrend, phenomenal stock this year, no meaningful pullbacks. So like when you get a pullback to the 50, you need to jump on it because you may not, you may not get another pullback to the 50 for, you know, quite a, quite a long time. So for five months. <laughs> yeah. These stocks are hard to get into. They really yeah. are. Yeah. Like when that, when that window opens, you, you got to jump fast because- Otherwise, you're chasing it higher for a long time. I own Zeta in my investment portfolio. I was in it in my trading portfolio. I took some profits. And now I have no idea when to get back in. Like, it just it doesn't look like I'm going to get a chance today either. RKLB. Oh, Rocket Lab. I mean, looks, yeah, looks, I mean, looks all right. I would probably, I mean, depends. I mean, you could sit up, uh, it's only up 2% pre market, which is actually surprising. Like, this is a, a more speculative beta stock. I would have figured this would be up 5 or 6% pre market. I don't love the setup here personally, but, you know, because you got rejected at 750 a couple of days ago. So I would probably wait. So I would either buy this one on a bigger pullback or i would buy this one on the breakthrough 750 that's just me personally right now it's kind of in in no man's land so it depends how tight you want to keep your stops i mean if you want to buy it at 726 and keep your stop 691 risk five percent i mean that's probably not bad i just you know everyone's trading style is different so i try to keep in my trading portfolio I typically try to keep my stops below 3%, pretty tight. And so I wouldn't get in here because I just, if it bounced off the 10 a couple of days ago, putting this stop under the 10 now is just too big of a risk for me to, you know, 5%. I don't like that. I would need a bigger pullback. I would need a pullback closer to the 10 or show some strength and push through 750. A couple more names. The next one was uh, Micron. Yeah. So I was actually talking about Micron this morning. So I got into Micron uh, last week. So this was a stock that I didn't really, uh, I've owned it on and off the last year. Mostly it's just, just a couple couple swing trades here and there. But the stock has actually pulled back 45% from those highs just a couple months ago. I think it was June. And if you go back to the 2022 lows, so go back to the 2022 lows, and that's the VWAP that we bounced off of about a month 
month and a half ago. And then we bounced off again last week. So I started a position in Micron last week on that bounce, that retest of the VWAP. So I'm in the stock right now. My stop loss would be below that VWAP. The company reports earnings next week. So keep that in mind. Uh, there could be some volatility around those earnings, but stocks pulled back 45%. It's now trading at 12 times the next 12 month earnings. They, ju they just finished their fiscal 2024. So they start their fiscal 2025 in September. So when we get their next earnings report next week, we'll get their full 2025 guidance. And analysts are looking for like 50% EPS growth this year. That's not, that's not going to be sustainable, but the stock does look pretty freaking cheap right now if they can hit these numbers in 2025. So analysts looking for 50% revenue growth and 600% EPS growth. So nine bucks in EPS in 2025, 12 bucks in EPS in 2026. Now they are, you no. Know, see, there's only two analysts though that are putting out numbers for 2027. So I wouldn't put too much stock in that, in those numbers. I mean, the stock's trading at 12 times right now, 12 times earnings. Maybe that multiple expands to 18 times with rates coming down. I think Micron's always be considered a cyclical stock because of DRAM pricing, but because now they're a big player in HBM, I think you're not, I think the stock shouldn't be priced as a cyclical stock as much as it has been historically. So I think this is a stock that could see some multiple expansion. I think it's overcorrected. And therefore, I think, yeah, I think you can own it here. But if it can't hold those VWAPs, then it's get out. So I, it's like, I like it, but I like it. I like it above 83. I don't like it below 83. Let's put it that way. Yeah, right. Let's do one more. Yep. And you? Oh, yeah. So this is one of my biggest positions, New Bank. So I was buying this stock at the beginning of last year in the fours. Fours. I cannot believe this stock got as cheap as it did. I don't think many people were following it or understood it. It's just an absolute beast of a bank. So they're based in Brazil, which is probably one of the reasons why nobody was paying attention to them. Uh, I mean, there's always geopolitical risk when you're dealing with these, these companies in South America, uh, but they're expanding into other Latin American countries and they're the they're going after the underbanked and unbanked. So, I mean, they went from, in 10 years, they went from startup to over 100 million customers, which is just incredible. Their margins are phenomenal. Management's great. So I love the company. It's my fifth I think my fifth biggest position, I did trim it yesterday, trim 10% yesterday because it's had such a monster run, but valuation is still very, very reasonable. Now, if you're trading it, I think you buy it above uh, 1512 on the breakout. If you're trying to own it, you can start a position here and then average down or wait for the next pullback. So, I mean, it just depends whether you're an investor or you're a trader. I mean, this is the kind of company... I think you can own for the next two, three, four years. So whether you buy it at 15 or 16 or 14, you know, if you're a long-term investor, it really doesn't matter. But don't if you're an investor, don't buy a stock unless you're willing to average down. That's that's how I look at it. If you're a trader, you know, I don't I don't love yeah. I mean, this is yeah, I yeah, you could buy it. Yeah, buy it above 15, stop loss. I mean, this one doesn't typically pull back much. Uh, this little pullback back in early August was weird. Uh, that did scare me a little bit because this one typically respects the 50-day pretty well. And then we got this just massive uh, drop-off. Uh, I was adding, of course. And then, so that's why I've trimmed the position up here. You know, it's rallied 40, 50% off those lows. Wow, Jesus Christ. So that stock's up 70% since the August 5th lows. Holy shit. I didn't Crazy. realize. Wow. So this, I mean, and th so this is why, like, I was adding to all my positions aggressively in early August. And now many of them are up 50% or more since those August 5th lows. And that's why it's like, I was just buying the stock in the nines a month and a half ago. Now it's in the 15s. Like, you know, I just, I can't get too excited about New Bank at 15 when it was just that nine bucks back in August. I mean, you know, same thing with App Lovin. Like as much as I like the company, I was loading up on the stock in the 60s. Now it's in the 120s. Like, I mean, I like it. I, I don't love it at 120. I loved it at 60. So that's like, that's my dilemma right now. I mean, I think we can rally in Q4. I think the 50 bips rate cut is good. The economy is in great... The economy is in good enough shape. Labor market's hanging in there. So like, I think the macro backdrop is great for stocks. I just don't love the valuations. Like I'm, at, I'm having a very hard time finding anything that I want to buy right now that I think is even remotely undervalued. So that's, that's my problem. Well, that's what those scans are for, man. Finding the next ones.
And that's why, like, I think for, for Q4, like I'm going, like, I think I'll be a bigger, it's more likely I do more swing trading in Q4 than like investing, you know, like I'm trimming my longs in my investment portfolio, but it doesn't mean that I'm not willing to put on some, some trades if the markets continue to act well, if that makes sense. So I just, you know, yeah, I think, I think in this, in any market, you have to be willing to, you know, adjust your strategy and your mindset, you know, based on what the market's, you know, what the market's giving you. Like, I mean, we're going to make a lot, I mean, we're going to be green today. So does that mean that I, you know, I trimmed yesterday, you know, if we're higher today, do I trim again? Well, not necessarily because the market's reacting this well to the rate cuts. I don't think this is a one day move. Like, I think this is the beginning of a yeah. strong finish to the year. So right. I want to, I want to stay invested. Right. Well, Jonah, man, it's been a pleasure getting to talk shop with you as always. If anybody who's tuned in is interested in uh, getting their hands on these scans that Jonah's using every day. We've got a 65 up to 65% discount available. And uh, if you sign up using Jonah's custom link, you get access to all of these scans. Just reach out to our support team at TrendSpider here and we'll hook you up with everything that you need. But Jonah, any last words before we sign I, off? And I must say like, what I do love about, I mean, a lot of things I like about TrendSpider, but you guys make it very, very easy. Because So I have my Excel spreadsheet. So when I go through my scans in this morning, like I have my column set up. So I'm looking for my, you know, my breakout scanner, my consolidation scanner, my retest scanner, my VWAP scanner, my 50-day scanner. You know, as I find the stocks that I'm interested in, I put them on my Excel spreadsheet and then I can copy and paste out of the Excel spreadsheet into the watch list on TrendSpider, which just it's probably something very small but it saves you a lot of time every day you don't have yeah. to keep retyping the tickers over and over from one place to the next and then what's nice is like so so i have so like my watch lists for each day and then at the end of each day i can copy that watch list into so i'll have my watch list for august and that way like at any point or and look at September. So like, these are all my watch lists from September. So if I'm rushed in the morning and I don't have a chance to go through all my scanners, I can just go to my, you know, go to this list here and see all of my recent scanners in one place. Right. So, you know, just a, a quick way to access, you know, the stocks that have looked good in the past couple of weeks, you know, which most likely still look good. Jesus Christ. There's a lot of green so, this morning. There's so many. <laughs> I was just thinking that. So, I mean, like, I don't, I hate, like, so if you're fully invested, these are great days. If you're looking to get in, like, looking to put money to work, these are not the best days. Like, yeah. this is, if you're sitting on a lot of cash, you're probably waking up this morning going, oh, shit, like, do I chase now? Like, what do I do? So, like, if, if I was looking to put, if I was looking to put cash to work, Digital Ocean, I don't think I would be chasing it here, but, like, hymns, I would. So, hymns, like, if hymns can break 17, 18, I would chase it there. So like, this is why I think trying to identify the right setups at the right kind of risk management levels are super important rather than just chasing what's up the most. For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, so I'm definitely looking to get into some more solar. So end phase is one of the names I would look at. I would say if it can break 125.30, I'm probably interested. Yeah. This one's, a, that one's the AV app scanner name today. I'd say Fluence above 2282. So the only three solar names I would touch are these three, Enphase, uh, Fluence, and First Solar. I would say I don't love this setup as much. I would say Enphase and, and Fluence look a little bit more attractive to me. Yeah, that one's a little extended. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe if you get sort of like a, a pullback to 244.52, I like it more. Hmm. All right, Jonah. Well, you have a good rest of your trading day. Thank you for Thanks, the time guys. and looking forward to chatting again. You got it. Talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Take care. Subscribe to Jonah Lupton YouTube channel for more videos and visit www.luptoncapital.com to check Jonah's various investing and trading services.